Okay, very good morning. It is Friday the 10th of July. We've had the Chinese state authorities come out looking to cool the phenomenal rally we've seen in Chinese equities this week where their local market has added nearly $1 trillion to its value. So that's dampened a little bit of the sentiment from overnight and we're shifting back towards a bit of an emphasis onto the coronavirus situation with record deaths tallied in both Florida and California yesterday. So I'm Anthony Chung, I'm the Head of Market Analysis here at Amplify Trading and this is your morning briefing. Uh, before I begin though, just having a quick look at the Amplify Now e-learning portal. Um, again, not sure if everyone who follows us on YouTube is aware of this, but just to give you a quick overview, uh, on the Amplify Trading website, if you click on the professional trading section up here on the top left, essentially on here you'll find located our on-demand e-learning platform. Um, what this is, I'll quickly show you, if you just hit start now, register your details, it'll take you through to the portal. There's some information that will be sent to you, but if you enroll, you essentially get access to three sessions from the Head of Trading Peers, myself and William DeLucy, our Managing Director who specializes in trading psychology. So really great way to get a good hour and a half's worth of free content, um, if that's what you're after. But ultimately, it will give you a good insight into the type of uh, education that we deliver to help develop our traders internally. Uh, on this platform, if you like it, you basically go through and you pay for an upgrade uh, and you get access then to a full suite of videos. I think there's about 80 videos in total. Um, there's also uh, assessments because you get professional qualification. There's also an app that, that ties this together as well where you can retrade histor historical market events. There's also private weekly webinars that happen. Uh, and for us being a macro firm, it covers everything from economics to individual asset classes, uh, all the way through to technical analysis, of course, but trading the news. So what I specialize in, uh, training strategies, risk management, psychology, and everything that you would need to, to really get a firm foundation to all of the key concepts uh, that are involved in trading. So I'll leave that to you to check out. Uh, again, just pop on the website. I'll, I'll put a link in the video description on YouTube, uh, and you can check it out this weekend if you get time. Uh, but otherwise, look, let's have a look at the, the charts for this morning, what exactly is going on. As I said, uh, sentiment a little bit dampened from the overnight Asia-Pacific session where Chinese shares were down about 1%. Now, I'll talk about the story uh, in a moment in a bit more detail. Uh, but that's led to some gen general selling in the equity index futures here. Um, let me just turn my Zoom chat channel off, otherwise we'll be hearing some buzzing sounds. Uh, but here you can see what was so interesting uh, yesterday. We had quite an aggressive sell-off um, shortly after the open on Wall Street. but. And what's quite clearly evident here, looking at the NASDAQ in the center chart for one, is just the power of the recovery when it came back. And actually, you know, it would have been a far cry to say to someone when we were selling off, breaking through uh, what, what was largely a, a technical-led move rather than anything new in fundamentals. When we broke through those previous uh, highs and lows that we had from midweek, we just saw some continuation. It kind of exacerbated the downside pressure. And at that point, you would have been a hard call to say that, yeah, we're going to finish at all-time highs again in the NASDAQ, which is what we did. Uh, but overnight, Asia, it did pop up at the beginning of the session. But as some of that Chinese news started to come out, uh, the market started to just fade ever so slightly. So we're almost back to, again, that same area of interest that was defining some of yesterday's uh, significant price action. So worth keeping an eye on there. Uh, so the S&P is kind of following suit. Again, the downside area to keep a close eye on, a little bit different to the setup in the NASDAQ, uh, just given the general tech outperformance we've been seeing. Uh, there's, a, there's a strong area of support around the S1 today, which is around the 31.07 and 05 and a quarter being the low point uh, of that initial selling that we saw in the open on Wall Street. Uh, otherwise, then elsewhere, the 10 years up a touch, about one and a half ticks, just some near term resistance at its R1. Gold really not playing ball with the general equity weakness or dollar strength, which would be more reflective of some moderate risk off at the open. Uh, the Dixie is up about two tenths of 1%, so perhaps that in itself just imparting a bit of uh, downside weight on gold uh, to counteract then any notion of it uh, holding its typical flight to quality status. Uh, gold then back to 1800 essentially, having got all the way up this week to 1830 
it's kind of uh, back down to where we were and worth keeping an eye on again when that equity move was moving lower yesterday uh, we're got close proximity to that pretty much the $1,800 handle is is a key level for today to watch for sure um, with the dollar strength both major currency pairs a little lower I uh, just wanted to quickly have a look at the euro currency because on a weekly it's just so interesting as we continue to respect you know literally week after week uh, that key upside level in the euro just can't get through it at the moment but I guess if anything the pullbacks are getting a little bit more shallow here uh, as we've seen over the course of the last month or so so that longer term trend line from uh, middle of 2018 that was respected in the beginning of the year before the pandemic really kicked in uh, and was tested around the initial period of the beginning of June continues to remain in play with the respective kind of horizontal resistance there so yeah, still remains a key level for this week um, or, and weeks going forward I should say uh, the other one to have a quick look at was oil um, been an interesting week for oil uh, quite a significant breakdown uh, in prices yesterday and if you look at the longer term chart here I'm looking at a daily continuation you can see that that was a very significant upside level here that had been containing the price and as we've gone through the last several weeks um, price activity really has been getting squeezed centered in around that gap down that we had at the beginning of March of this year uh, and interestingly we are just trading through that trend line now this morning so something to keep an eye on uh, and if as what seemingly appears to be the case there's a little bit of the optimism that we've seen generally dominate market sentiment this week is starting to fade a little bit as we potentially see some de-risking going into the weekend um, it's been more I'd say normal behavior this the weekend just gone was quite unusual because the the overnight activity was fairly benign and there wasn't really much um, rather than just a flat open but previous weekends to that we've nearly always seen a relative um, gap down in US equities uh, with the tune of around 0.6 to 0.8 percent and again this idea of de-risking people are still a little bit COVID sensitive I would say uh, and definitely developments in America would say that we're still far beyond um, the worst case at the moment and so yeah if that continues uh, and that really starts to get into the mindset short term then certainly that will have implications for for oil in the near term price movement and with oil we're just looking at some of that nearer term price activity I mean we've got to go back to late June when we were trading around 37.50 so still about a dollar and a half to go till we got to that point so yeah be interested to see how oil performs as we go through this session uh, particularly if equities start to flag and people do de-risk you might well see oil following suit and just trending lower throughout the rest of the day okay quick look at some of the headlines then China state funds start selling in a warning sign for stock rally so Chinese shares were down uh, around a percent overnight as two state-backed funds said they plan to trim holdings in a sign basically that the government um, foresees this this phenomenal rally we've had this week as a slightly overdone and would be something they'd want to just harness and control to a certain degree because obviously they don't want it to be too inflated because then the inevitable might happen and it pops and you see quite a violent breakdown in price so what's happened overnight there were basically two uh, state-backed funds one's called the people's insurance company of china um, the PICC and the other one is China's National Council for Social Security Fund which is basically the country's national pension fund and the PICC's second largest shareholder um, they said of course that the, the the kind of sale was part of their regular divesting activities but of course we know that's not really the case and it comes after the Chinese stock market has added around one trillion dollars of value this week um, so yeah this is it's quite common you know this is where China does differ although it's pursuit to become this global trading partner and uh, to kind of liberalize its practices in order to encourage foreign investment and you know we know what their long-term objectives are they still are very much um, involved let's say when it comes to the free forces that move markets in a developed market world sense doesn't quite exist to the same degree in China uh, similarly when the markets were breaking down in 2015 over fears of a of a hard Chinese landing when GDP was 
dramatically decreasing. It's almost the reverse. The state-backed funds come in and prop up the market, and now we're getting the, almost a reversal. Uh, so again, it's kind of that uh, state intervention to try and control this. Um, other than that, though, I mean, I wouldn't look at this as, uh, uh, I, I guess, a, a main factor that's going to really dictate things, but it might just be um, the kind of one catalyst that just takes that, that positivity that generally markets have had for most of the week uh, out of the picture. Because if you think about what's been happening is every day, particularly midweek when China, when the first news came out um, about the Chinese media looking to just kind of call to arms for the retail traders to prop the market up, European markets and the US markets followed in kind as we kind of went through that 24, 48 hour period. But now that's come to an end. Obviously, it just removes one of those factors. And as I said, going to the weekend, it wouldn't be unusual to see uh, perhaps some chips taken off the table. Um, elsewhere, then, the coronavirus situation is, is still to be to be monitored. Um, obviously, the country that's, that's seen quite a rapid increase of late has been further developments in Australia overnight, this time in the state of Victoria. So they continue to try to tackle this latest outbreak. Um, so their um, kind of line, if you like, of new confirmed cases of COVID-19 has shot up quite dramatically. Um, UK and Europe still relatively flat. The US continues to climb at a slow but progressive rate. Um, on that point then, cases in the US now in excess of 3 million, of course. And looking on a state level, uh, Florida, Texas, California, those three kind of most in focused areas. Uh, so to here to add a bit of context, um, still increasing. Um, the, the death toll is what's captured a few headlines in the overnight uh, session. Record deaths in Florida and California. Uh, Texas Governor Abbott predicts that next week will actually be the worst regarding the coronavirus situation and pleaded that wearing masks is the only strategy remaining in order to avoid another shutdown of their local economy. Uh, elsewhere in New York, the mayor has cancelled all public uh, events. And one interesting thing then that I was looking at was this, which was a, a graphic looking at um, the state of the localized economies and whether or not they are reopened, reopening, paused or reversing. And obviously it's the Sun Belt which has drawn the most focus of late in the recent week or two. Um, but interestingly, although this map would suggest then that the reopening process has only been reversed in a handful of the US states. One of the things to be aware of here, and I was reading some analysis from Goldman Sachs this morning, and they said that 40% of US population lives in states where reopening has been rolled back or delayed. Now obviously here when you look at this, you can see the big three of course, California, Texas, Florida, my understanding percentage wise just thinking of the figures is that they equate to around 28 to 30 percent i guess the the 10 percent top up comes out of these areas like arizona colorado michigan and so yeah i mean this this is significant from a case of you know economic data had been wildly outperforming to the upside particularly in these soft sentiment based forward-looking measures um, uh, but will that the actual definitive economic picture keep pace with that? And that's why I've always kind of been a little bit uh, of the view that that's probably unlikely to be the case. And at some point then that optimism over that recovery picture is going to slowly dissipate. And underlying that is the practicality of when we looked at those Google mobility movement scores. Yes, to a certain degree, behavioral changes might will happen for um, both consumers in terms of their purchasing behavior and also employees from a company working from home behavior. But I don't think that's going to be rapid enough to offset the idea then that the economy at the moment in the places that matter still is not anywhere near back to a degree of normality. When it comes to these areas like Texas, like Florida, like California, I mean, you've only got to look at these trajectories. They're, they're not even plateauing at this point. So that would suggest then that there's still a lot more pain to come uh, on this front, both from a health point of view in those areas and from an economic point of view. So it's going to be interesting over the coming weeks to see how that plays out. 
The only other thing I wanted to mention was about the EU. Again, I don't really see this as a definitive force to base any sterling position on. I would say you're probably better off looking at the dollar and general using that as a guide and barometer of sentiment to trade the pound. Um, the pound naturally is fading. I think a lot of the, the midweek pump was due to the expectation uh, and, and then the delivery. And it was almost a buy the rumor, sell the fact with Rishi Sunak and his kind of summer stimulus. Um, so the EU basically back to Brexit uh, have said that their stance or the UK's Brexit stance will add to virus damage for firms. So what they're saying here is, quote, inevitable disruptions are going to occur on the 1st of January 2021. Uh, so when the transition periods and that risks compounding the pressure that businesses are already under due to the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, Michel Barnier using Twitter this week's discussions confirm that significant divergences remain between the EU and Britain. Um, as I've said at the beginning of the week, um, now that we know that these kind of relative timelines for Brexit, um, some of these key meetings, uh, Eurozone summits, the kind of anticipation around the importance around the autumn, um, this is exactly where I thought that we would be. So that's why I think markets are fairly comfortable with this kind of um, idea that basically there's still significant divergences, there still is hard to make any uh, movement forward on a collective basis, yet I see that as completely as expected because there is a lack of pressure, we're too far away from these these deadlines yet for either side to really buckle too much and make these significant concessions to get a deal over the line. That point I think still will come in time, we're just not there yet and for the moment I think focus remains elsewhere in the short term for the broader global market. Okay, calendar-wise then, very, very quiet um, as per the week. So I'll do my best to issue the macro menu this weekend and, and hopefully next week will hold a little bit more action for us. But for the morning, talking of the here and now, the only thing of, of semi-interest is the IEA monthly oil market report. That'll be at 9 a.m. London time. Uh, then we've got the US PPI data, yet yeah, Canadian jobs data, unemployment rate, employment change. You've got the Baker Hughes rig count as well for any uh, US traders. And that's pretty much it. So with that being said then, could well be that focus tends to lie uh, more toward perhaps COVID updates, those regular updates that we see. Uh, the initial idea, and I think does have potential for some legs, just given the fact that the NASDAQ has been up at record highs. You know, we've seen quite an interesting technical break here in oil. Um, and equities, I'll keep an eye on that S&P around that 3,100 3, level, which is close proximity to around yesterday's low um, for any further de-risking going into the weekend. Um, and if that does happen, then again, it's not so much of a news catalyst, but a sentiment play. And just picking your spots from a technical perspective to execute around those trades and manage your risk will be the, uh, the appropriate course of action, I would say. All right, that is it. So remember to subscribe to the channel. More videos, of course, coming from my, my colleagues this weekend. I wish you a fantastic weekend ahead and I will see you next week. Thanks very much, guys.